the iHeartRadio app. It's later with Mo Kelly. I am not Mo Kelly. I am Tiffany Hobbs sitting in with you tonight. Mo is en route to Seoul, Korea. He should still be on the plane until about midnight tonight, a little bit after midnight, when he'll be touching down to experience all that Seoul, Korea has to offer him for his with his dojo, for his martial arts practice. It's a huge deal. And while he is gone for the rest of this week and all of next week, I will be holding it down for part of that. Next week will be Chris Merrill. We're really looking forward to being here with you, and we're going to have a fantastic time. We're not going to burn it down while Mo is gone. We'll give him something to come back to. Who else is here? We have Tawala, as usual, our super producer, Tawala Sharp here. We have Miss Jackie Ray sitting in for Mark Ronner, who's out tonight. We have Steph on the boards, as usual, and we have Matt. We have the lovely Matt who's here. So we'll be talking to him as well, probably at some point in the evening. He's new, so we got to break him in. He's been doing a fantastic job. Hi, everyone. Hi there. Everyone's waving. Hi, Hi. Steph. (laughs) Hola, hola, hola. Awesome. So we're going to get into it. We have a lot to cover tonight, a lot to cover. There's been just a rash of crime in the last few days. This is Los Angeles. That is not necessarily a surprise, but who the victims are and how perhaps these crimes came about may, in fact, be the difference. We're going to talk about all sorts of things. Juneteenth is today. I have a shirt on about Juneteenth. Juneteenth is today. And and you may have some questions about why we are celebrating Juneteenth. And I'm actually going to express to you my frustrations with Juneteenth. And we'll get to that in the second hour. We will do some viral stories because it's Wednesday. And on Wednesdays, I'm usually here doing the viral load. That's where you've heard me. Usually don't hear me until about 9 p.m. But you're getting me for the whole three hours. We'll still do some viral stories. We'll get into some other things, including why the USDA is suspending avocado inspections. We're also going to talk a little bit about why California is now fining Amazon. A lot to get to, a lot to get to. So let's start it off. Do you have a car? Are you a commuter? Do you have a car? Do you park your car inside of a garage where it's safe? Preferably your own home garage, not necessarily a paid for garage, something with more security. Or are you like many Angelinos and many in the South Bay who are parking their cars outside of a garage, making them susceptible to not only weather, but to anyone who might be interested in doing anything nefarious? Are you feeling increasingly paranoid that your car might be vandalized? If so, then this story will probably speak to you and tick you off. It's a major story in Los Angeles as it again involves the the University of Southern California, which happens to be my alma mater. Most recently in the news because of the protests and now in the news because of a fatal stabbing. And we've been covering it on KFI. All the shows have been covering it. I have some other things to kind of add to it, including some news that's emerged, uh, some updates in the story to let you know kind of what's going on. But first, there is a man who was fatally stabbed on USC's Greek row. Now, let me explain to you what the Greek row is. Having gone to USC, I'm very familiar with this area of the campus. It's a long stretch of multi-million dollar homes that are separated by lawns and small strips of land in between. There's an alley that runs behind this long stretch of homes in this exclusive neighborhood that was purchased by USC to house the Greek community, those who have pledged different sororities and fraternities. It is called the Greek Row by others, but is commonly known as the row. Now, in this alley behind these multi-million dollar homes is a large constituents, constituency of homeless people. They're transient, so they're not always the same. It changes. There are people who have been there for months and months and months, and then there are those who just pass by, as is the nature of homelessness anywhere, but especially in Los Angeles. Saturday night, 
they there was a gathering at the row on the row there are parties it's a it's a fraternity sorority area there are parties all the time there are parties into the wee hours of the evening it's always populated and as this is now the ending of the term at sc they've already had their graduation there are still people who are behind who don't necessarily go home for the summer they hang out there was a young man there named ivan gallegos Ivan's a 19-year-old student. He's going into his sophomore year now at USC, and he was there on the row partying, enjoying his time. He was with a few friends. And as the story goes, Ivan and his friends, two to three of them specifically, were in front of one of these homes, and around 8.15 p.m. on the 700th block of West 28th Street, Ivan and his friends noticed that there was a man attempting to enter the cars parked along the street there in front of these homes. This man was going around, checking door handles. This was reported by friends and bystanders, other witnesses, checking door handles until he found one that was unlocked. He got into the car and stayed in the car long enough for Ivan and his friends to confront him. When Ivan and his friends walked up, there were words exchanged According to Ivan, the man brandished or said at least that he had a firearm, some sort of weapon. Ivan then, and this is where the story kind of gets a bit muddled. There aren't a lot of clear details, but what we do know is that Ivan then somehow got access to a knife. There was an interaction between Ivan and this man resulting in a stabbing. Ivan stabbed the man multiple times. The man ran off, ran back to this alley where he collapsed. And when authorities arrived on scene, the man was already pronounced dead. So Ivan was arrested and held at the, at the, at, at the, you know, where they, where they take people who do this sort of thing, right? And he's now being held on $2 million bond. His friends, and I'll get to this in a little bit when we come back from break more in depth, his friends have been interviewed and they've gone into detail more about who Ivan is and what would have prompted such a thing. But what we know now, as far as the emergent details, are that this homeless man was 27. His name was Xavier Cerf, and he was kind of known in the area as being a transient a lot of people as well in the area say that this sort of crime is constant that these break-ins have been on the uptick and so the reason that i find that this story is very interesting is because it really speaks to a sense of vigilante justice no longer being a concept an abstract concept that we might think of, but instead being a go-to strategy by which people are employing because they don't necessarily feel confident in law enforcement's ability to respond to crime. People are essentially tired of being victimized, and Ivan stood by and watched as this happened. So when we come back, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how I feel about this story, maybe get into some more facts. And again, we'll talk about the friends and witnesses who were interviewed and what they feel about Ivan and what they think should happen in the wake of this. I'm going to tie it together as well to another story that happened last year, not in California, but in New York that deals with vigilante justice. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. It's Later with Mo Kelly. I'm Tiffany Hobbs filling in for Mo tonight. We last talked about this fatal stabbing at USC's Greek Row. It happened this previous Saturday, June, uh, whatever date that was, June 15th now, around 8.15 p.m., During a time when the row, the Greek row, was very populated. And because it was very populated, there were young people out who took it upon themselves to confront someone they perceived as committing a crime worthy of confrontation. That crime was the vandalism of a car, perhaps more if time were to allow. And those who stepped in were essentially spearheaded by one young man, 19-year-old Ivan Gallegos, who is now in jail on a $2 million bond 
due to stabbing the assailant, this 27 year old homeless man, Xavier Cerf, multiple times, resulting in Cerf's death. I was talking about why I believe this person was stabbed, why he was confronted. And living in Los Angeles, there are numerous incidents in which those of us may be bystanders, witnesses to crime. We've talked about it a lot here on KFI. You may have talked about it with your own families and maybe come up with a contingency plan. Should you also witness some sort of crime? What might you do? Well, Ivan Gallegos answered that question and the answer resulted again in his arrest and now being held in jail on what could very well amount to charges of murder because that is in fact what happened. And this is a sense of vigilante justice. There are lots of people who are fed up with crime and you'll see it. You'll see it on social media. You'll again hear it at your dinner table. You'll hear it at your water cooler if such a thing still, if you're still going to work in the first place, right? Not just working from home, but the sense of helplessness is pervasive and the want to do something is growing. And this young man, Ivan Gallegos, 19, a USC student, did in fact do something. And that very well will jeopardize his future. At this point, his life is forever changed. At this point, the person who was breaking into the car's life is now gone. So there are two lives that will be forever altered because of the, of the decisions that were made that night. But essentially, again, there's story after story of attack, of vandalism, and there's more stories about people taking the law into their own hands. We can't pass judgment. I'm not here to pass judgment. I'm not here to convince you or try to influence you as to whether or not Ivan was right or wrong about what he did. That's not my place. It's not your place either, to be honest. That will come when he has his day in court. But... When we are faced with a scenario, a scenario that could be similar to seeing someone breaking into something or shoplifting or whatever it may be, what do you do? There was a show you might have watched. It aired on ABC. It still does in syndication. I'm not sure if there are new episodes and someone can jump in and let me know if you believe you know the answer to this. But it's called What Would You Do? It's hosted by David Quinones. And the premise is that it creates provocative scenarios and puts unknowing citizens in these scenarios to gauge what their natural reactions might be. Again, the title is, What Would You Do? What would you do? What would you do if you were witness to a break-in? What would you do if the victim was someone you knew? And then again, what would you do if you felt like you might be able to actually thwart a crime? What would you do if you felt capable of stopping a crime? Do you jump in? Do you call police and wait? And there's a story coming up about Long Beach and wait times with police, response times, and what people have been prompted to do in the interim. Ivan and his friends said that they called police They didn't wait for police to arrive before they acted. Police arrived post-stabbing. What would you do? Intervening can have complicated results. If you're lucky, the criminal stops the act. Maybe your words are aggressive enough. Maybe your size is imposing enough. Whatever the case, the criminal stops and you are able to walk away from this, from this scene, from this uh, incident. If you're unlucky, perhaps someone dies or is really injured in the process, like this story with Ivan Gallegos and Xavier Cerf. This alleged homeless man was killed. This story reminds me of another story. And the story that came to mind immediately is a story that is from last year, 2023. And it actually happened in New York on a subway train. There was a street performer, a man known as a street performer, who also was known to have some mental health challenges, mania, whatever it may have been. And he was on this train and he was performing or asking people for money and people were uncomfortable. One man stepped in 
and decided to enact what he believed was at the time vigilante justice. He felt compelled to stop this street performer from soliciting money and whatever else he was trying to get. And that feeling of, 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 of what entitlement, I guess, or that feeling of needing to intervene resulted in this man, Daniel Penny, strangling Jordan Neely to death over the course of six minutes. Six minutes where Jordan Neely was choked by Daniel Penny on the ground in front of onlookers on this train, on a very crowded train in New York, resulting in the death of Jordan Neely. Bystanders and witnesses had a lot to say about Daniel Penny, talking about who he was or is as a person, why they felt he was, again, compelled to do this, whereas others had things to say similarly about Jordan Neely. And both, in the eyes of their friends, should have been exonerated. But only one was able to walk away and now is facing charges that will will be reexamined or or fleshed out later this year in October. So again, what do you do when you sense that a crime is happening and that you feel is uh, possible for you to intervene in successfully? Do you wait for police? Do you take it upon yourself? Do you measure the possible consequences of either? This isn't a television show. We're not in a reality show. It's not scripted. So whatever it is that happens is something you're going to have to reckon with in real life, as this young man, Ivan Gallegos, is doing now. There are no cameras to yell cut. There's only the consequence of what's happening. When we come back, we're going to talk about a driver who was stabbed to death after a car crash. Road rage is called road rage for a reason. Rage is in the phrase. It's right there. He was stabbed to death. We're going to talk about why, some thoughts about it, and then we'll get into another crime that happened. There's This is the crime hour. We're going to talk about crime here in the Southland because it is it is a very present issue. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. I'm Tiffany Hobbs sitting in. Do not get out of your car if someone hits you. Do not do that. Do not confront people. Do not go all big bad and try to try to talk to someone or talk someone down from their road rage. Rage is right there in the phrase. It's in the title. Rage means not of sound mind. People are not doing well out here. Do not try and confront someone. You might end up on the news like this news, this next story we're going to talk about. And this is where wisdom And discernment comes into play. It's needed in every situation, but especially in high stress situations like during traffic collisions. Don't confront criminals. We learned that in the last story. Don't confront people who are pissed off if they hit you, especially if they hit you. That already tells you that they're not ready to take accountability. This is what you shouldn't do. So a person got rear ended. This happened in Linux. Just yesterday, or just yesterday, in fact, at the intersection of 111th and Larch Avenue, Lenox, right there near Hawthorne. It's right near the 105 freeway. There's a donut shop nearby. There's multiple schools in the area, populated area, and it happened around 1230 in the afternoon, broad daylight. There was just a simple auto collision, two cars Car rear ends, one car, both people get out, and the person who did the rear ending was so irate that they decided that they were going to stab the person they hit. Makes no sense. Makes no sense until you remember, again, that road rage involves what? Rage. It involves rage. The person got out of their car, according to witnesses, And walked up to the other person, they both exited their vehicles, and stabbed the person, this other male, on or at his upper torso. And the person who was stabbed 
fell to the ground and people came around and they called law enforcement and paramedics. And he unfortunately died at a local hospital. The suspect, the stabber, fled the scene. The guy just took off. They have a description of the car. It's an Infinity SUV. A lot of these, uh, for whatever reason, a lot of these crimes involve Infinity SUVs. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what 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 kind of makeup people who drive Infinity SUVs have. But whatever the case, if you drive an Infinity SUV, you may be very well apt to commit a crime. You might want to think about switching your car. Person has an SUV, an Infinity. They don't know where he is. They don't know who he is. There's some idea as to what this person um, or who they could be. But as of right now, according to all reports, the suspect is on the loose. So not only did this happen, but this stabber is just out there in the public able to do this again should they come into an, an interaction that involves a car crash. But again, This is where wisdom and discernment comes in. You need to be wise. You do not just get out of your car when there is an issue. The Citizen video, there's an app called Citizen, showed a large portion of the street which was cordoned off. Okay, so people were out. They were approaching the scene. Again, there were schools nearby, schools out for the summer in most cases, but it's the middle of the day. People could have, kids could have been on the playground. There were, there's a strip mall nearby. There's a neighborhood. I looked at the Google Maps aerial view of this neighborhood, which I'm somewhat familiar with. And there are just bunches of houses, bright day, beautiful weather, middle of the day stabbing. That shows you just how emboldened people are. Okay. And just how short fuses are. And again, this stabbing remains under investigation. No one will talk. People on the scene don't want to give up much information. They just know that this happened and that unfortunately it resulted in the death of a young man. So I've witnessed plenty of accidents, again, like you have. And what I learned recently is that if you call 911, which you should do, You can ask for a mediator. If the police can't arrive at the scene quickly and you can ask kind of what's your ETA? This is, it's getting heated. You want to start dropping some, some integral phrases. It's getting heated. I don't feel safe or whatever the case may be. They'll send a mediator if you ask in the form of a parking enforcement person. You can get someone out there to just stand literally in the middle of you and the other people or person so that it doesn't come to this situation. And then you also have another witness on the scene. Use these strategies. Do not try and be a hero. Don't go after the homeless man breaking in the cars. Don't try and confront someone because they hit your car and you're all pissed off and your hands are waving and you're angry and you're saying choice words. It's not going to end well for you. You have to keep a level head. Easier said than done. I get it. But when you don't, these are the sorts of things that can happen. These are the sorts of things that can happen. Another story about not keeping a level head involves a secret service agent. And we're going to talk about what happened with the secret service agent when we come back. It involves the secret service agent being robbed. You know crime is at an all-time high, that crime must be a huge problem if criminals are robbing law enforcement. That is not a good sign, people. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly On Demand from KFI AM 640. It's Later with Mo Kelly. Tiffany Hobbs here with you filling in. Let's wrap up all this crime talk. It's been too much crime talk. At this point, you're probably fatigued with it and You know, either finding a place to move or figuring out a way to arm yourself before that tax kicks in. Whatever the case, let's wrap it up and we can move on. A Secret Service, get right back into it, right? A Secret Service agent was robbed at gunpoint in Orange County. Why is this important? Because he was just across town from Former president, or former president, wow, I hope that's not the sooth saying, President Biden at Biden's gala in downtown Los Angeles, where they were raising a whopping $30 million to support Biden's campaign. The Secret Service agent was in Tustin, California, again, Orange County. So it's an Orange County story, Orange County story. And he was minding his business 
when a person walked up to his car and attempted to steal a bag out of it. Okay. The Secret Service agent decided that he would try to correct this criminal and he dislodged his weapon. Fortunately, no one was hurt, not even the criminal who managed to get away. Some of the Secret Service's Secret Service agents' belongings were recovered later, but it speaks again to this this idea that crime has no specific victim. You can be victimized no matter where you are. You can be victimized at this point if you are a Secret Service agent working for President Biden just across town, off duty, minding your business and trying to exist while you have an off night, right? That happened. Let's go across town, same same weekend, downtown Long Beach, Business owners are upset because of the response time of police. And I talked about this a little bit earlier in the stories that we covered because one of the things that's been present is that people are calling police, but they're finding that the police response time is a little too long for their liking. So they're acting in the interim. They're trying to fix the situation while the police are in route. And in this case, There are a group of Long Beach business owners, 13, in fact, who have been victimized over the last 12 days. So in the last almost two weeks, 13 businesses have been vandalized, have been robbed. And these business owners are essentially forming a collective to discuss how frustrated they are with the lack of prompt response times from law enforcement. In one specific story, a person's business was vandalized. They called the police and the police responded, quote unquote, when able, which was three hours and 51 minutes after the initial dispatch. So it took almost four hours for police to respond. And in the interim, these business owners decided that they would try and do what they could to both patch up their business, secure their business and comfort each other. But it speaks to a larger problem. It's not always, if at all, the law enforcement's fault for their response time. In fact, it's more so indicative of staffing being understaffed, being stretched so thin because there are so many crimes happening simultaneously. Big crimes, small crimes, secret service agents in Orange County being robbed, people over here at USC being uh, vandalized and, and then being stabbed because of that vandalism. There's crime happening all over the place. And any glance at your social media or any glance at your local neighborhood crime reporting app will tell you and it becomes overwhelming probably like these last stories have been if you've been listening but they're important because you should know what's going on around you and how people like yourself are probably feeling you probably feel very similar to these Long Beach business owners who are upset that when they call police, police aren't necessarily responding in a timely fashion. Who do you point fingers at? Who can you blame? It's a blameless situation. Everyone's doing the best they can with what they have. There's one specific woman. Her name is Kimberly Latham. She was watching her friend's business. She has a business herself. Kimberly does. It's right next to her friend's business. Her friend went out of town and she's watching this business when all of a sudden security calls her at four o'clock in the morning and says, hey, your friend's business is being vandalized. Kimberly gets in the car, she heads down there, and she finds that she makes it to the site before police do. Frustrating. And in her making it to the site, she and others, again, helped patch up the store, helped board up these broken windows. Her business was the last of the three that were hit this weekend, again, adding to the grand total of 13 total businesses hit in this one specific area of the East Village District in Long Beach. So these businesses, again, are indicative of a larger crime wave. 
there's surveillance cameras, there's people paying attention, there are police who can respond and do respond in more timely fashions, but the average is that the time is taking too long and business owners are asking for the bleeding to stop. They're saying that it's just a free for all. And of course, if criminals know that people or police aren't going to be responding in a timely fashion, what does that then prompt criminals to do? Commit more crimes. They know police aren't coming quickly. They have time to get away. And they know that people aren't going to want to confront them. So they have time to get away. The bleeding has to stop. It is just, it's hemorrhaging at this point around the city. But yes, yes, crime is going down. So they say, so they say, I'm using finger quotes, crime is going down. Doesn't feel very much like it at all. And unless it feels like crime is going down, then you're not going to have citizens who are comfortable either being business owners, parking their cars on the street, or just living their lives. It's KFI AM 640 live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. Later with Mo Kelly, but I am Tiffany Hobbs sitting in. We're watching everything so you can watch your sanity. KFI and KOST HD2. Los Angeles, Orange County. Live everywhere.